right, so I was able to get all the exams graded this morning, so everything should be up and posted for you to see. Um, concerning the exams, it kind of fell into two categories. I'm going to say that particularly the people who were active in the discussion board, you probably saw that reflected in your grade. Um, those discussion board questions, two of them came, two of the exam questions came directly from those discussion boards. This is going to be kind of a trend you see. So the harder concepts are more discussed on the discussion boards. They're also going to be on the homeworks and the packets. Now, I will give you fair warning for test three. Do not get into the habit of believing that there is a question in the homework or there's a question on the discussion board or there's a question in the packets that's literally going to be on the exam. The concepts are all there, but this is kind of where we're seeing the Chem 2 transition from Chem 1. Chem 1 was pretty low level in terms of concepts. You pretty much just had an idea and you repeated it on the exam. For chemistry 2, we're not, we're not really testing like individual concepts so much as ideas. So the idea of method of initial rates is how do you figure out the orders of reaction, the rate constant K, based on initial rate data. There are lots of combinations I can throw on there, but they're all the exact same idea. They're all the exact same process. Same thing of graphical analysis. I can give you pairs, I can give you sets of three graphs for days and days and days. The analysis doesn't change, but the problem is going to be different. Um, so this is really a good way to describe test three is that you're going to see lots of examples and not one of those examples is going to be on the exam, going to be on the exam exactly. Like problem three on the packet is not going to appear on the exam. But you're going to find the exact same concepts are being assessed on the discussion boards, the homeworks, and the study packets. So this is where I would really encourage you to go to these resources and use that. Now, if you have questions, you're free to reach out. And I'm going to tell you to do that, that if you have questions about the exam, ask questions about it. I'm not going to go over the exams line by line because, again, a lot of what I saw kind of correlated to activity on the discussion boards. The discussion boards, you can post and see other people's answers. Like, this is very much how the forum's going to work for you trying to, like, work in groups. Now, I will address an issue I saw on the discussion board last week. Now, the discussion board last week concerning thermodynamics, admittedly, that's ahead. It's for the test three material. You didn't need to do it. But I am seeing a misconception I commonly see a lot on this discussion board. I see it in courses all the time. It's not really a reflection on you. It's a reflection on how this is taught, particularly in high schools and by very lazy instructors. Entropy is not disorder. It's not chaos, it's not randomness, it's not any of those things. This is just something very lazy people do to explain entropy, and it's a lazy explanation because it's wrong. There's a great um, video I posted to the course website, it's by PPS Space Time. They go through the nature of entropy and they show that you can have very well-ordered pattern systems that have high entropy. So saying it's disordered, Disorder is a subjective word. You people may sit back and say you're a disordered, you're a disorganized person, but you may know where everything is. You may be on top of things, just to them it looks disorganized. Order is kind of the same thing. There are order parameters, but they're very crude mathematical approximations. The thing is that we can calculate entropy correctly. Now I did see that people posted um, comments like entropy is the amount of waste heat or unusable work. That's not wrong, but that's a very engineering definition of it. And I would say that it's really a very limited case. So that definition of it being waste heat, I'll give you marks for it because that is an engineering definition. But the reason why this isn't true, it actually comes from where this definition originates from. So a PV phase diagram going all the way back, the way engineers use this is you will get constant pressure, constant volume lines that um, these are related to the ideal gas law, PV equals RT, where the N has been absorbed into this V. Um, basically with these, what happens is that we have some heat source and we apply heat to our engine and it does work and then the heat is released into the environment and this is your T delta S term the reason why this is misleading is this is what's called a heat cycle. And the heat cycle is going to require you to have moving parts. So your engine is an example of a heat cycle. You ignite the gasoline, which expands the piston out. So the piston is going to expand um, under the influence of the heat of the gases. The piston is going to move as the pressure drops, and this is going to do work on the engine. And then you're going to exhaust the heat gases 
and that's where you lose your efficiency. The only thing that really does any work in a, a combustion engine is the expansion of the gas against the piston. But all that heat is just waste. Now, why is this an incorrect way to look at the world? A battery doesn't have this. So a battery, we have delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Your Nernst energy, E, So we're not there yet. But anyway, basically a battery produces electrical work and it uses the full delta G. There is no waste T delta S energy. And because of that, you can't say that entropy here is wasted heat. It's actually part of what makes a battery work is that delta S term. So delta S being the entropy doing waste heat only works if you're limiting yourself to Carnot cycles or heat cycles but that's a very limited case of engines and it's a very 1960s mindset. So entropy, if you're looking for a crude definition, is more the degrees of freedom. So basically, how constrained are the atoms within a system? And this constraint can be a physical constraint, it can be electronic constraint, it can be a rotational, vibrational constraint. The more degrees of freedom a molecule has, the higher the entropy. So a good example of this is trying to get you to explain why does a gas have higher entropy than a liquid? Because you can't explain this by randomness. If you try to say, well, it's more random motion, well, a liquid is not an organized material. Those molecules are randomly bumping around as well. Gas molecules are doing the same thing. So what's the difference between a gas and a liquid? Well, if we look at a liquid at a very microscopic scale, our, water, our liquid molecules here are all near each other. So they can only go so far before they start bouncing off basically a cage of surrounding molecules. Now, if we look at a gas, a gas, particularly an ideal gas, can expand infinitely. So the molecules, the odds of them hitting each other are astronomically small. So they end up having a lot more translational degrees of freedom. A water, a mo water molecule in liquid water is within basically a cage of water molecules. That's as far as it can go, whereas a water molecule in the gas phase can go as far as it wants forever as it wants and will never be constrained. So this is why gas has more entropy than liquid because it has more translational um, entropy. It has the ability to fly out more. Now, the degrees of freedom here, I say we're not going to quite specify what these degrees are. For physical changes, this makes a lot of sense. Now, really what it is is the number of microstates. So a microstate is an arrangement of atoms and their electrons within a given system. We're not gonna define what the system is. But just think of it as a container. And how many different microstates will give the exact same energy? So if we calculate the temperature, pressure, and volume for a given set of atoms, do we, how many different ways can we arrange those? The number of microstates, omega, is connected by Boltzmann's constant to entropy. So this is another reason why you should really question the definition that entropy is randomness because we can quantify it. We can actually put a number to it. And this is the proof why entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin is zero because there's only one microstate. When you're at absolute zero, the electrons all have to be in the ground vibrational energy. There's no rotational, there's no translational. The entropy is absolutely defined as zero. So zero entropy actually has a lower limit. We can define it as zero based on this definition. So another way to kind of explain entropy is, and again, trying to get away from this this definition is think of, think of it that you've got three shelves with three boxes and you're trying to put items in the box you're not randomly putting the items in the box if you really think about it you're probably going to put things in the lowest box first because it's the easiest box to access so if we have our person putting things in a box they're probably going to put them into that one first and makes sense it's the easiest to access and this is where atoms prefer to be, is the lowest box. But let's say we deal with a really tall person. 
Well, if we have a really tall person, they're probably going to put it in the center box. And the reason they're going to want to put it in the center box is that it's easier for them to access. It's not random where they're putting it. They're putting it in a place that's easiest for them to access. Now, the analogy in this analogy, the height of the person is related to the temperature. So as they get taller and taller and taller, we start putting things in more and more boxes. But the other thing to keep in mind is that a very short person, assuming we don't give them a ladder, only has a choice. doesn't have a choice. They have to put it in the lowest box. A tall person has more options as the box that they can put into it. And this is what we see with the entropy of the system. As we increase temperature, the entropy tends to increase, not because it's more disorganized. It's because that the electrons now have more energy so they can access more energy states. Now, the average energy distribution is going to be the same regardless of if we look at the microscopic level we're going to see a whole bunch of different ways the electrons are put into these energy boxes the energy is the same for any configuration of boxes but the point is they have more options at higher temperatures they have more boxes that are available to them because they have more energy and that's why the entropy increases again it's not disordered if you take a crystal and heat it its entropy will increase not because you've made the crystal more disorganized but because now the electrons have access to more vibrational uh, modes which they didn't have before so that's just kind of the tie rate on entropy. Again, if you've been taught it's randomness, get rid of that. It's not randomness. It's not disorder. That's the very wrong way to look at it. Oh, the other one I kept seeing, and I get why students miss this. Gibbs versus Helmholtz. So if delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, which is also delta U, plus delta PV minus T delta S, and then Helmholtz delta F is delta U minus T delta S. And the question I asked you in the discussion board is what is Gibbs and what's Helmholtz? And I got the normal response, people clearly searching for Wikipedia. But here's the thing, this is actually a lot easier to understand than you think. So this is just the sum of all energy. So if we think about money, okay, you are worth so many dollars, but it's not like you only have like money in your pocket. You also have debt. You have credit cards. Your credit cards represent potential cash because you can spend that money even though you don't have it. So that would add towards your cash, but your credit card debt would definitely take away from it. Checking and savings accounts act differently. Mortgages are debts, but they act very differently than student loans. They act very differently than college debts. And so Delta G here, is just the sum of all the different terms. Now, at this level, we stop at the delta H minus T delta S terms because that's traditionally where we stop. And these are single phase properties. So this is the energy within a single phase. And that's why this is a misleading definition. Delta H is also T delta S plus N delta mu. So mu here is the chemical potential. It's the energy um, gained or lost when an atom loses a phase. So if we have two phases, this is the energy between phases. Now, we don't talk about chemical potential at this level. That's something that's much better reserved for physical chemistry. But if you look at everything that goes into delta G, it's actually an infinitely long term. If you've got any type of electronic potentials, voltages, that will show up in the delta G expression. If you have magnetic fields, that shows up in the delta G expression. So delta G equals delta H minus C delta S. That's like saying equals MC squared. If you look at the full definition of that equation for equals MC squared, there's other terms in there. It's just that for non-relativistic speeds, E does equal MC squared. Once you start getting close to the speed of light, it doesn't equal that anymore. There's more terms that pop up. This is a nice, simple definition, but there's a lot more going on. But at their hearts, G's and F's are just the sums of the energies, all the different energy contributions for a given system. So if we have a puddle of water, there's delta H, which comes from the internal energy, delta U, which is the energy of the bonds, delta PV, which is the work energy, T delta S, which is the entropy, um, N delta mu, which is the chemical potential. All of that's in there. Helmholtz is basically the same definition, but the thing is that it's constant temperature and volume, and this is constant temperature and pressure. So why do we have to make this distinction? Why does pressure versus volume make a difference? And the easiest way to see this is to think about a car piston or any type of piston. So if we have a piston of gas,
and we start adding heat to it, Q, what does the piston do? Well, as we start adding heat to a constant pressure, so the outside pressure stays the same, as the gas gets warmer, it's going to heat up and it's also going to increase its pressure. So to compensate, the piston is going to move. So as you heat a constant pressure system, you're doing two things. You're heating it, you're increasing the temperature, but you're also doing work. So delta G refers to systems where it can exchange energy doing work. So if you apply 100 joules to this piston behind me, temperature doesn't go up corresponding to 100 joules. It goes up corresponding to the, joule, the heat plus the work. And we see this reflecting what's called CP versus CV. CP is the constant pressure heat capacity. As the material begins to heat up, it begins to expand. Its volume gets bigger to compensate for the fact that its internal pressure has increased, so it expands its volume so the pressure is where it should be. If we have constant volume, we can't do work. So if we're at constant volume, this piston never moves. So there's no work. And because there's no work, Every joule of heat we apply to this piston goes directly to heating the material up. It doesn't go to doing any work. So because of that, our constant pressure heat capacity is always greater than our constant volume heat capacity. Now for solids, we don't really see that huge difference. CP roughly equals CV. You're going to be right to like two decimal points. But for a gas, this is a lot. It ends up being like 10 joules per mole Kelvin. Like It is a lot of energy difference between CP and CV. So this is why we have to make the distinction between constant pressure, Gibbs, and constant volume, Helmholtz. Because with Helmholtz, we don't have the option of doing work. This PV term here doesn't exist. And because we can't do work, the way energy is exchanged becomes much more limited. But for the Gibbs case, Gibbs we can do work. So we have to account for the fact that not every joule that goes into our system necessarily goes to heating. It may also go to changing the volume of our reactor. So why have you probably never heard of Helmholtz, but you've definitely heard of Gibbs? Well, in terms of the lab, we're almost always under constant pressure situations because our reactor is always open to the air. It's incredibly dangerous to run sealed reactions, so generally we try not to do it. So at atmospheric pressure, the pressure of your reaction is set. Everything you're running is at one atmosphere or whatever your atmospheric pressure happens to be that day. So if you're heating a liquid, it will expand in the beaker and it will expand so long as its pressure stays at one um, atmosphere. Now, there are exceptions to this. Two big exceptions for why we would need to work with Helmholtz. The first is um, bomb calorimetry, which is done in a sealed reactor. So when we do bomb calorimetry, we're only working with CVs, and so we're limited to this Helmholtz case. This is an esoteric case, but it's necessary. The other time we're limited to this is actually computer simulations. So computer simulations rely heavily on the Helmholtz free energy. And the reason they do that is that it's a lot easier to control the volume of a system in a simulation than it is the pressure. Because in order to do a simulation at constant pressure, you have to constantly change the volume of the container that you're simulating. Which means you have to calculate the pressure and then iterate the volume until the pressure goes back to where it's supposed to be. That's a lot of extra steps. So if you just keep the volume of your simulation, your hypothetical system in a computer constant, then it's a lot easier to work with. You don't have to constantly do those updates at every step of the way. So computer simulations, which are actually done quite a bit, those all work on Helmholtz free energy and there's a way to convert delta F to delta G in real world situations. But that's the big difference. And that's why we have to consider pressure versus volume because pressure lets us do work, volume, constant volume does not. All right, so that's it for my comments. Um, got the text chat menu up in case any of you have questions. I'll give you a few minutes.
No more questions out there, I guess. No one's out there. I'm here if you got questions. Again, these are office hours. They're they're not lectures. If you have questions, you're gonna have to ask them.
question mark. Here, the problem on the exam, assuming the following reaction is elementary, what is the pressure dependence of the following reaction? So let me bring that question up. I mean, if you do find mistakes on the exam, you got two weeks to let me know, but do let me know if you have questions about like a particular grade. Particularly with the um, automated grading stuff, a lot of that can get kind of weird, or it can be off. Okay, so what's the gas pressure dependence of the following reactions? We have SO2 gas plus carbon solid goes to CO2 gas plus sulfur solid. And if elementary, it would be written as this, K concentration of uh, carbon, concentration of SO2. SO2 is the only gas, so it's the only one that we can use that substitution X of SO2, T naught over RT. So this would be a first order dependence. And that's usually what I see students when they make a mistake on questions like that. Like um, they try to count all the reagents. It's not all the reagents, it's only the gas reagents. Yeah, the problem is actually designed that way to make sure you're paying attention to the phases. You're welcome. Are there any other questions?
down to the one year or so.
looks like I'm kind of the only one here now. So again, if you ever have questions, please feel please feel free to email them in advance. And I will see you all tomorrow.